OK. Hi, everyone. Bonjour, tout le monde. Merci d'être avec nous euh, aujourd'hui pour la dernière conférence de, de notre série de séminaires, donc de l'année 2018-2019. Uh, I think I speak for everyone at the Pragmatic Health Ethics Research Unit when I say that it's been um, really nice hosting this series of seminar. Um, we've received a really wide variety of speakers and heard from different perspectives, and we're very much looking forward to repeating the experience again next year. Um, I'm particularly honored today to be able to present uh, to you Amy Harbin. I've been wanting to invite Amy to Montreal for a conference for a very long time since I read her book. Um, and it's, it's great to be able to um, invite her in this space uh, because, I, because reading her work um, was also a way for me to understand how my own approach to philosophy could be informed by more em empirical work and by different uh, types of discourses. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the book that I first read um, when I discovered Amy's work, and then I'll just... Um, let her give the conference. So I first read um, Amy's book, Disorientation and Moral Life, um, a few years ago. And um, this book is a really important book that brings together insights from feminist philosophy and moral psychology, as well as first person accounts of the disorientations of experiences of migration, trauma, grief, queerness, um, illness, and feminist and anti-racist consciousness raising to provide its readers with a compelling account of the moral significance of disorientations. And I think that, um, for me at least, one of the most important lessons that Amy's book teaches us is that um, experiences of disorientation are not an oddity. Um, rather, most of us will encounter disorientations at some point in our lives, if not at many. And so experiences of disorientation are unpredictable, messy, and complex, and they can be incredibly harmful and upsetting but their ability to call into question central aspects of our lives also make disorientations a key issue for philosophical reflection, um, but also just any type of reflection on the value and meaning of human life and the ways in which we share it with others. Uh, aside from publishing Disorientation and Moral Life in 2016, Amy Harbin has published um, extensively on the topic of disorientation and experiences of medicalization um, and LGBTQ experiences in healthcare settings. Um, so yeah, so um, without further ado, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome her with us today for a talk titled uh, Disorientations in Clinical Encounters. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to say thank you to Corinne for all of her work to organize this. It's a real honor to be here. Um, I'm just going to get set up one second. So I noticed because of the format, it's my fault that some of the PowerPoint slide notes are a little bit off. They're totally readable, but you can ask me too if they look too confusing. I'm happy to read them for you. Um, so what I want to do today, I know that Corinne has already given a generous introduction to some of what I've said about disorientations. I'm going to start just by giving the briefest of overviews of what I've said so far about disorientation in the book and some other pieces, um, just to give a sort of like breakneck speed summary of, of what I've been interested in saying so far. And then I want to spend most of the time talking about two things regarding disorientations in clinical practice. So the first arrow here is about what I've said so far about disorientations in clinical practice. There are three sort of areas that I've talked about so far. One is about just the medicalization of disorientation at all. So I want to just tell you a little bit about what I've said there. The second is about um, this area of qualitative and quantitative research in clinical psychology regarding two things which people may or may not have heard of. One is post-traumatic growth and the other is resilience. So both of these are areas, as I'll talk about, that are informed by positive psychology. Um, basically, the, I got excited about both of these areas, especially the post-traumatic growth literature, only to be really, really disappointed and angry about them. So I'm going to tell you a bit about that. And then the third area I've written on already is about how disorientations can manifest in clinical practice with members of marginalized groups, and specifically members of people who identify as queer, so LGBTQ, et cetera, um, patients. So that's what I've done so far. So I'll, t I'll tell you a bit about that. And then I want to conclude by talking about future directions for appli applications of disorientation in clinical contexts. And I have three that I'll 
discuss at the end. And I, I want to leave time so that we can have a discussion and I can hear from you about ways that you see this resonating or questions you have and so on. Okay, so what disorientations are? So in a series of articles and in my book, Disorientation and Moral Life, I've argued that disorientations are sustained experiences of not knowing how to go on. They in every case involve feeling like one doesn't know how to continue in one's life or one doesn't know who one is now. Disorientations regularly follow devastating events like the loss of a loved one or serious illness or trauma or um, oppression or migration, sometimes feminist education, coming out as queer and other events. In all cases, what I've said is to be disoriented is to feel up in the air and unsure of oneself in more or less debilitating ways. So I was pushed to sort of break down what I really mean by disorientations. Um, and so I've come up with these three um, characteristics that I think all disorientations share. Um, and then they sort of vary along these uh, axes to different degrees. So I think that all disorientations are sustained, difficult experiences that make it hard to go on. What I mean by sustained is that these aren't just passing momentary experiences basically that happen quickly and then we return to feeling normal or oriented. Um, so a question that I often got asked when I was first presenting the work was, oh, you know, disorientations, yeah, I think I've had that kind of experience like when coming out of a subway and not knowing where I am or when landing in a new city um, and not knowing how to get around. Um, and so this pushed me to realize, no, that's not what I'm talking about at all, right? I mean, different experiences in one sense in that they're longer, they're, they're more sustained than that. It's not just a momentary um, quick thing that, that quickly um, fades. So having said that, the length and the sustenance of disorientations can vary a lot depending on which we're talking about. So some are gradual, others can come about more suddenly. Events or experiences that were once disorienting can cease to be disorienting, as for example, when we adjust to the loss of a loved one over time. Experiences that don't at first spur felt disorientations might become disorienting, for example, as when a chronic illness is manageable at first, but then worsens to the point of disrupting your life plans. So, you know, there's all kinds of different experiences. They're all sustained in some sense, but they vary greatly. Likewise, all the disorientations I talk about are difficult in the sense that they add strain to an individual's life, making it less easy than it would be without such disorientation. But the character of such difficulty varies greatly among these disorientations. Again, so take the example of um, disorientation in a feminist classroom. I teach in philosophy and women and gender studies, so I teach feminist theory every year. Inevitably, there are people who come into the class happy and they leave less happy, you know, uh, more confused, sometimes angry. Um, that's difficult, and I think in some cases they are disoriented. Um, but that's not the same kind of difficulty as you'd experience if you lost a loved one, right, if a loved one died. Um, so. Difficult in different senses, all difficult, not, none are very happy, um, but they're difficult to different degrees. And then finally, all these experiences make it hard to go on. So again, this varies immensely among the different cases I talk about. All the cases I talk about stop short of making it impossible to go on. So I make a point of this in the book, right? They don't, they're not fatal. They don't make it um, completely impossible to continue in one's life. Um, but at the same time, they're more than a minor challenge to one's capacity to continue in your life as, as the way you would want to. So this is a quote from the introduction that I think gives an overview of what I really hope to achieve in the book. So it says, part of moral life is relating to a world where serious disorientations are possible. Moral agents are all the time planning our lives while knowing that they may be disrupted, developing capacities to respond well to such disorientations, and being in relationships with others who are disoriented. Our experiences of disorientation can teach us about how to live responsibly in unpredictable circumstances. So there's a lot more that could be said here about what I think disorientations are, right? I could go on probably for days about it. Um, but what inspired me to write the book was just as Corinne said, I think that these are ubiquitous experiences. I think they're happening all the time. I think it's rare to find someone who's not experienced a disorientation. Um, I, in general, like people who have been disoriented more than I like people who haven't been, right? I have a hard time relating to people who feel ex exclusively oriented all the time. Um, and so that's sort of what inspired me. I think that these are interesting, common, everyday, nonetheless difficult experiences. And I wanted to 
write about them for that reason. Okay, so now this is the slide where I try to pack like three chapters into one PowerPoint slide. Um, and so it may not make sense, but let me walk you through what I was thinking with it. Um, so in this column, these are the different kinds of disorientation that I talk about in the book. I spend the second chapter talking mostly about grief, and then I spend the third chapter talking about disorientations associated with racist oppression, white privilege, consciousness raising, and feminist education. And then I spend the fourth chapter talking about disorientations related to illness, trauma, queerness, and migration. Is that making sense so far? So that's, that's what I was, you know, these are the main ones that I was talking about, and there are lots of other cases that I could have talked about, but these were the ones that interested me most. So then what I did in writing the book was engaged with a number of empirical literatures as well as first person autobiographical memoir accounts of being disoriented um, in these various ways um, to determine that there are often certain kinds of changes that are um, generated by these experiences of disorientation. And I should say as just background, one more note is that philosophers, of course, uh, if, if people are familiar with moral philosophy, you know that philosophers are, I think, obsessed about being oriented. They're quite focused on the importance of knowing what you want to do and completing that action, resolving how to act, as I talk about it. Um, and so it's kind of a shock and a little upsetting to philosophers often to think that not knowing how to go on might actually have any positive effects at all. And of course, that's what I've hoped to show in the book. Okay, so these, in the middle column, these are the changes um, generated. Again, looking at those various empirical and first person accounts, these are the changes I managed to show, I think, that have been generated in some cases by being disoriented. And again, like Corinne said, Lots of disorientations do not generate positive effects at all. Sometimes they're exclusively harmful. This isn't necessarily what will follow from being disoriented. It's just what sometimes has followed. And that alone is surprising to philosophers. So from the top, top kinds of disorientation, racist, depression, and so on, we can see that some, some of these cases have made awareness of oppressive norms and political complexity possible. So from these ones in the top, most of what most of the changes I focused on are generated awareness. Okay, so becoming newly aware, for example, about how racism works, or newly aware about how sexism or um, other oppressions work. So most of that is um, about awareness. Whereas the second group here that I talk about in chapter four, illness, trauma, queerness, and migration, the changes generated there have more to do with living unprepared. Um, sensing vulnerabilities, what I've called in this togetherness, uh, which you know surely there would have been a more succinct way to put that, but I couldn't come up with it at the time, and living against the grain. So just to give you a sense what happens in these two chapters, um, so focusing on experiences of racism, white privilege, consciousness raising, and feminist education, I show how the disorientations following such experiences in some cases generate awareness of contingent oppressive norms, and awareness of political complexity. And then I argue, right, so the third column is what I argue in terms of ethics. It's not yet obvious from the second column why that's a good thing, right, morally speaking. So the third column is what I argue philosophically and morally that even when these kinds of awareness in the, in the first line there do not help us resolve how to act, right, even when they don't tell us what to do, they are or can be morally and politically beneficial insofar as they generate epistemic humility, resistant re-identification and collaborative action, all of which are beneficial in moral contexts where humility, re-identification and coll collaborative action are sometimes needed. So again, that compresses a whole chapter and I could talk more about it, but that's, that's the general sort of argument about those ones. So then focusing on experiences of illness, trauma, queerness, and migration, I show how the disorientations following such experiences in some cases generate capacities for living unprepared, sensing vulnerabilities in this togetherness and living against the grain of norms. And I then argue that even when these kinds of capacities not only fail to help agents resolve how to act, but also actively compromise moral resolve, right? so actively get in the way of us being decisive at all, they are morally and politically beneficial insofar as they generate shifted habits and expectations, 
that more accurately reflect and better respond to conditions of unpredictability, vulnerability, and inter interdependence. Okay, so that's the sort of structure of the argument. Really, you don't have to read the book now because it's all just right there for you. Um, that's what I was hoping to show is that these kinds of disorientations can have these changes and that those changes can be morally beneficial given the context that we're living in. Um, so important to my account as I've sort of gestured to already is the fact that I'm not arguing that disorientations cultivate moral resolve, the ability to decisively act, but instead that disorientations in some cases generate the other capacities I've described for philosophers, the claim that disorientations can have morally and politically beneficial effects without helping agents decide how to act is often counterintuitive. One of the major assumptions of the history of ethics, as well as of Frankfurt and those who've taken up his approach, and contemporary moral psychologists like Joshua Green and Jonathan Haidt, is that the best moral agents are the ones best able to clearly evaluate their options and decisively act. So my claims about the sometimes promise of disorientations require seeing that in some cases, decisiveness is not only not the most important moral characteristic, but actually sometimes morally counterproductive. So decisiveness could actually be bad for us. That's part of the suggestion. All right, so that's all I'm gonna say about the general account. Again, if there are questions, I'm happy to um, talk about them as they come up. But I wanna turn to how I see this applying in clinical practice. Um, so like I said, I wanna survey three areas that I've already talked about um, in applying disorientations to clinical situations, and then I'll conclude to point by pointing towards some future directions um, for how I'm thinking about disorientations applying in clinical work. So in terms of the first application, and thinking about why disorientations should not be automatically medicalized, um, Having established what disorientations are, one of the first things I was keen to argue was that disorientations themselves should not be medicalized experiences. That is, they shouldn't be treated in all cases as instances of mental illness or disorder. The reason I was prompted to think about this and to argue this is because just like the I come out of the subway question that always came up, the other question that always came up was, but that's, do you, are you spelling disorientation like DYS, like a dysfunction? Are you talking about a mental illness? Are you saying that there should be a new category of mental, il mental illness in the DSM and so on? And I wasn't wanting to say any of those things. Like I said, I think these are common, uh, ubiquitous, important parts of moral life. So one of the first things I tried to argue for in this piece, um, disorientation and the medicalization of struggle, was that disorientations resist categorization as psychiatric disorder, mental illness, or emotional dysfunction but are nevertheless regularly medicalized through healthcare practices. So things like pharmaceutical treatments, mandatory professional medical leaves, and so on. So in the piece, I use the case of Charlotte Perkins Gilman, which people might know. She was um, a controversial white author who wrote in the late 1800s into the early 1900s. Um, poet, she has, a, she has a number of books, short stories and poetry. Um, and she uh, famously had a kind of breakdown after having a child. Um, she decided to leave her husband, um, moved, with, moved with a friend who has later been read as a lover of hers, um, had this kind of breakdown, which was at the time diagnosed um, as, a, as a kind of breakdown and has later been reinterpreted as a sort of depressive episode or something like that. Um, so rereading her work, I, I use in this piece, I talk about how I think that her, her experience could instead be seen as a kind of disorientation and what would happen if we were now seeing it that way instead of seeing it through the lens of a medical disorder, right, a mental illness. Um, I also talk about what was happening at the time. This came out in 2014. There was a lot of debate, people might remember, about the new edition of the DSM that was coming out, DSM-5. One of the controversial things was that they were wanting to remove the bereavement exclusion from the category of depression, which would mean, had meant that people who were experiencing grief wouldn't be immediately diagnosed as having depression. There was a waiting period, as you might think, like two months, where you know people might experience symptoms much like depression, but if they were in grief, their medical professionals were told to hold off on diagnosing them with depression because it might be a normal kind of grieving experience, not, not an illness. So I discussed that as well. Um, 
the bereavement exclusion in the DSM-5, and there were, there were other controversies surrounding grief at the time. But the, bigger, the biggest sort of point that I wanted to make in this piece was to try to draw attention to disorientations as one set of complex and difficult experiences. And I hope to add to feminist bioethicists' cautions about the categorization of experience into either health or illness, right? I wasn't saying, and I still don't say, that disorientations might dovetail with experiences of mental illness. They might overlap with them. Um, they might be part of some experiences of mental illness. But I worried about seeing them as exclusively um, pathological, right? Things that should be medicalized. So categorizing some kinds of experiences and not others as uniformly dangerous means that uniformly bad or so, so seen experiences receive attention from state systems like medical and criminal systems in undesirable ways, while other kinds of experiences seen as uniformly good could fail to receive the attention they need. So I cautioned against the medicalization of disorientation and suggested that experiences of disorientation could indicate how the complexity of emotional experiences could resist dichotomies of health and harm. Okay, so that was sort of the first clinical application, a general one, to the question, should we medicalize these experiences? No, right, that, that was my first point. Okay, in the second clinical application so far, um, this is where I talk about the two areas of positive psychology informed research and clinical psychology that excited and then deeply worried me. Um, so I don't know how many people have heard of this area um, of clinical psychology research on post-traumatic growth. It's actually a massive literature I came to find out. Um, I initially encountered it because some of the people writing, so these are mostly, um, you know, this is all research in clinical psychology, a lot of quantitative research, some qualitative research. And what people are saying is that they've found that in doing work with their patients in in psychological settings, they found that sometimes following experiences of trauma, so in cases where people have a diagnosis of PTSD, they're in some kind of therapy, following these experiences, in some cases, people develop um, these kind of surprising um, growth kind of um, outcomes. And they list, they list a, a, I'm trying to see if I have the full list here. There's a whole list of these kind of growth outcomes, including warmer relationships, uh, increased sense of their spirituality, clearer priorities about what they want to do with their life, um, and so on. I think there's about seven of these things in most of the work, and now, and now some more. So um, on, on my first glance, I thought, this is exciting. Here are people who are talking about something kind of like what I'm saying. Disorientations can promote something like uh, morally beneficial outcomes. This will be good. I'll look into it. And then I realized quickly that a lot of, well, all of the research really is focused on certain kind of outcomes as being the kind of growth they're looking for. And you can already see it in this little list, right? They're looking for what I've talked about as being moral resolve, which I'm not interested in. So strengthened relationships, right? These are people who say that having experienced trauma, they're closer to their family and friends. They are clearer about what they want to do with their lives. They are... Um, more committed to their religious um, background, and so on. Um, they're grateful. There's an increased gratitude for their experiences, including their traumatic experiences. If you're interested, you can Google this, and you'll find TED Talks galore about it. Um, not surprisingly, one is you know about a woman who had a, a serious diagnosis of cancer, and but she wants to see this as a gift in her life. Um, so I don't want to like disparage TED Talks, but it's kind of what you would expect of some TED Talks, right? Um, that kind of like, I'm making the best of this. This is a kind of optimism. I'm very excited about this. So there, that's the kind of growth they're interested in, which right away is a red flag for me. I'm not only interested in that kind of growth. Um, fair enough if people want to say that their relationships have been strengthened after these experiences. But this research only reads these kinds of growth as the kinds of growth that count as growth, if that makes sense. Anything else, including the kinds of ex the kind of outcomes that I'd charted, would not count as growth on this view because they are not um, they're not helping resolve. They're not helping people decide and be decisive and be more focused in how they will act. Okay, so I could get carried away here, but I'm not going to. Um, so this article, the top article, tries to introduce two ethical concerns about the account of post-traumatic growth. 
and the practice of growth oriented, oriented therapy. Um, one is a, is a question about the assumed ideal of health. Again, so this idea that what it is to grow is to become clearer and more focused and, more, and stronger and more grateful and all of these positive psychology inflected sort of terms. I'm worried about that as the kind of um, ideal of health underlying the research. And then I'm also worried in the article about implications for clinical practice. So there is something called growth-oriented therapy um, where people are encouraged to practice with their clients in a way that will help bring about growth following their traumatic experiences, and I'm very worried about that. Um, I got deep into like reading some of the some of the books aimed at therapists to try and coach them on how to practice this therapy, and there are, I think, serious worries about doing, doing therapy that's aiming people at this kind of growth. Okay, so that's the post-traumatic growth literature. And then another literature um, related, but, um, but even bigger, actually, than post-traumatic growth is resilience literature, which people might be familiar with from um, positive psychology. There's a great deal of literature focused on how people can be resilient after traumatic events. Um, this too might seem something like what I'm saying, right? Disorientations could make you um, able to withstand or, or um, go through life in better ways after them. Um, resilience research sort of seems to be saying something similar. Um, but in this paper, I'm worried particularly about how such research is performed on marginalized groups. So there's a whole subfield of resilience research that's focused on how um, trans kids can be resilient, how black women can be resilient, how low-income people can be resilient, um, and I, I suggest that best case scenario, that research would have to change dramatically in order to be um, palatable at all, basically. So these are two sort of more areas of application of disorientations in clinical psychology. And then the last area of application um, is the one that I said was going to be focused on marginalized groups and how disorientations can come up in everyday clinical practice with members of marginalized groups. So this research actually comes out of um, a qualitative research team that I was part of based in Halifax and Vancouver. We did interviews with um, queer identified women, uh, queer trans identified women in Halifax and Vancouver, and then a number of providers, so doctors and nurses were the two groups of providers that we did interviews with. All of these people, of course, were self-selecting into this, the research, right? We recruited them. That's especially relevant for what the doctors and nurses had to say about their practice because these were not, in general, jerks. Like, none of them were against providing uh, care to queer trans women in Halifax and Vancouver. All of them thought that they were doing a pretty good job. I think all of them were able to see that they were providing care to queer and trans women in Halifax and Vancouver, which of course not all clinicians would even think that they are providing care to any queer patients. Um, so it's relevant to think, you know, the providers that we interviewed were self-selecting, pretty, um, pretty well, well-intentioned at least um, clinicians. And so in the first piece from this, we drew on these interviews with uh, patients and their providers. Um, to talk about how while one of the most common measures of improved cultural competence in healthcare practice is self-reported increases in confidence and comfort, we actually found that more attention to disorientations and discomfort in queer patient and provider encounters would be required. So basically in doing the interviews, we found that both patients and providers were often talking about feeling uncomfortable or feeling like they didn't know how to go on in care with their patients. Um, or in coming out to their providers. And a lot of people were just talking about it being awkward, uncomfortable, not sure. Um, this came out a lot when people talked about whether the decision about whether to come out to their providers or not. Should I even? It doesn't matter. Why should it matter? But when pushed on, you know, why would you be reluctant to come out to them, it's because they were worried about harms having done that. They were worried about awkwardness. They were worried about discomfort. So, you know, a lot of the focus on how do we build better clinical care for members of marginalized groups is about building ease, trying to work at comfort, trying to work at uh, making people able to talk openly with one another. And what we tried to argue is that actually these moments of discomfort were some of the most um, fruitful moments actually in these encounters where clinicians and patients both were able to acknowledge that they felt uncomfortable um, and work together in those moments. 
So these are not just moments to be avoided, um, basically. And then the second piece, too, came out later from that same project, um, which examines ways in which queer, lesbian, and bisexual women negotiated their visibility in their interactions with primary health providers and argued that the work of negotiating such visibility must be recognized in efforts to account for and improve healthcare interactions with queer patients. So again, this was very focused on um, the surprising number of uh, queer patients, clients, who said that they really carefully decided how they would look going into these interactions. Will I look queer? Will I take out my piercings? Will I, you know, whatever stereotype of queer, queer, what queer looks like that they had in their mind. Will I bring my partner or not? Will I say anything about having a queer partner or not? Um, and so those moments as particular instances of, of discomfort and what we could do with those moments. Okay, so those are the three main contexts that I've um, talked about so far. And what I want to do just in a couple minutes now before we um, turn to discussion is talk about three areas that I'd like to see disorientations applied in the future. And these are ones that if people have thoughts, I'd be really grateful for. Um, or maybe you want to do the work of applying disorientations in these contexts, that would be also better. Um, so three areas, and they're all ones that have come out of my um, work in the qualitative project that I talked about, as well as in living in the US now for seven odd years and teaching bioethics every year for seven years. So these, these now are ones that I've come to think of as moments where disorientations happen quite a lot. So the first, the first area of, that I have as uncertainty about best practice, I think it's, it's possible and likely that probably disorientations come up a lot when clinicians are unsure about best practice. And of course, that uncertainty happens in all kinds of areas um, of clinical care. But the, the one area that I have in mind is coming out of that queer health project, in the, the one where we interviewed providers and, and clients in the two sites in Canada, um, one of the things we found, I got to do a lot of the interviews with the doctors, which was super interesting to me. Um, as a philosopher, and Corinne and I were talking about this earlier, I don't often get to do qualitative research. It's, it's a super interesting shift. Um, and so in interviewing the doctors, something that came up over and over again was that they were really worried about how to treat trans patients and especially trans kids really worried about it. And it was surprising to us because we weren't talking about kids and most of the questions weren't specifically focused on trans care. In fact, we kept trying to redirect back to more general questions about queerness. The project was about queerness in general, not just about practice with trans patients. But the doctors were really, they brought it up again and again, and often with a sort of like, here's a case, you know, here's a case, what am I supposed to do about this? Kind of to me as though a philosopher knows anything about anything. Um, and so it really struck me that this is like, this is one area where there's a, a great deal of uncertainty about best practice, although there are good standards and there's lots of good resources for best practice with trans kids and certainly trans adults. Um, this is one area where, where clinicians were really worried about how to go about this practice and they were expressing lots of distress over particular decisions you know, how, how to respond to trans kids coming to them, whether they should always refer them to other providers who knew better, um, where they should refer them, what, you know, what ages certain kinds of therapies should start and so on, very specific questions. Um, and so this seems to me in, uh, as one of the areas where there's still not enough access, I suppose, or not enough, certainly enough training in best practice with trans kids. Um, and it's so therefore one of the areas where clinicians are experiencing a lot of disorientation, right? Not knowing how to go on. And that's, you know, that involves lots of different kinds of concerns that they have resulting from not knowing, um, not having been taught this, this not being a regular area in, in medical school. But this is one area I think where some reflection would be valuable about how to support clinicians and not knowing how to go on, right? What do we do with their moments of not knowing how to go on? So that's just one area. The second area that I've thought about quite a lot is focused on clinician grief. So this is an area where th some things have been published. Um, quite, you know, quite a bit has been published on moral distress in clinicians and on, um, on, on grief specifically. This is something that comes up. So like I said, I teach bioethics regularly. 
most of my, half of my students are philosophy majors, half of them are going on to med school or physician assistantship programs. So we do a number of things in the class. We watch, maybe people are familiar with a PBS frontline documentary called Facing Death. If you've never watched it, it's devastating. I have them watch it at home so that everyone can cry by themselves. Then we come back and talk about it. Um, I don't watch it anymore because I've cried too many times over it. But basically, it's about decisions regarding when to stop treatment and when to start palliative or hospice care. So everyday decisions that happen all the time. The very non-dramatic decisions associated with end of life. So not focused on euthanasia or um, any kinds of physician-assisted suicide. Just focused on how do we know when nothing more can be done for a person and they need to start contemplating their death. So they watch that. We read an article by Delise Weir, um, which is interviewing third year medical students about how prepared they feel for dealing with death and dealing with grief. And of course, like unsurprisingly, the answer is not prepared at all. They're terrified. They don't know, they're not trained to do it. They don't know how to do it. Um, and then a third of the class, I have my class do these book clubs within the class, and a third of them read the recent Atul Gawande book, um, Being Mortal, which is talking all about, you know, again, physicians being bad at knowing when to con consider death instead of considering treatment unto death, right? And he talks about his own father's experience, and it's also like super, super tear jerky. So clinician grief is another area where I think basically there's a lot to be talked about in terms of disorientation. Part of what I tried to show in the book with respect to grief is that, you know, this is one major area of disorientation for people. People do not know how to go on, don't know how to go on following um, the loss of loved ones, but I think it's also true that clinicians don't know how to go on following the loss of patients, particularly early on in careers. Um, and that we see burnout associated with, you know, later stages in careers facing death all the time. Um, and so it's additionally complicated, of course, because clinicians aren't really supposed to be the ones grieving in these encounters. Certainly with patients, their, their grief cannot be the primary focus. But it seems to me that bringing a disorientation lens to thinking about their grief um, could be useful. Okay, and then the last... The last sort of context that I'm interested in thinking about going forward is uncertainties and disorientations regarding uncertainties about how to address injustice in medicine. Um, so in the US, there's been recently a lot of conversation about racial disparities in maternal, morta maternal mortality. Um, and I think there has been in Canada as well, but in the US, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, just this year reported that African American, Native American, and Alaska Native women die of pregnancy-related causes at a rate three times higher than white women in the U.S. So this is the shockingly, like how can this possibly be a huge, huge um, variation in dying of mostly preventable pr pregnancy-related causes. So of course it's widely recognized that better identification of risk factors and of symptoms during pregnancy and postpartum could drastically reduce these rates of mortality and that this would be facilitated for women of color by ensuring access to basic things like affordable health care, better communication and support from providers, access to stable housing and transportation, and so on. So this isn't a really complex situation where we don't know that there is a problem or where we don't know what to do about the problem. It's actually just a really easy situation where we know exactly that there is a problem and the solutions are, are very obvious. And yet, of course, it's a difficult problem to solve because there are massive injustices, um, you know, widespread racism, ableism, classism, sexism underlying the problem in the US. Um, and it's bewildering to know how to begin to address those kind of problems. So part of the account of disorientations in the book focuses on how action against injustice can involve non-resolute actions, right? Not ones that we decisively and clearly pursue, but actually more complex kinds of actions. Um, and I, you know, in the book, I talk about three kinds of these, both and actions, so doing things that seem conflicting at the same time, um, building without blueprints, which is to say, you know, trying to create something that we don't know how to create yet, a, a non-racist healthcare system in the U.S., for example, and doubling back actions, meaning things that require us to constantly go back and try and fix things, um, retreading the same ground to fix things over and over again. So that's sort of a sketch of where I might go with the injustice in medicine piece. I think that thinking about non-resolute actions to address something like dis disparate rates in maternal mortality might be um, one way to do that. <laughs> 
Okay, so just to conclude, this is um, basically my goal in establishing the account of disorientations and their moral significance has been to try to do justice to what I think are ubiquitous experiences in everyday life. And again, I think these are relatable. I think many of us have these experiences. And I think that clinical contexts, fraught as they are with difficult decisions, constant loss, right, constant grief, constant uncertainty, very often trigger disorientations for patients as well as for clinicians, um, researchers, and potentially policymakers. So I hope to have shown how understanding disorientations and their moral significance could illuminate the emotional complexities of these contexts and point to the potential for disorientations in clinical encounters to be not exclusively damaging, but in some cases morally productive. That's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, super interesting. And I have lots of questions, but maybe just one, and maybe the answer is in your book, I haven't read it yet. Uh, is You said sort of some benefits associated with this disorientation that are more individualistic or sort of first person benefits, mm -hmm. like moral growth. Um, I'm curious, what's the sort of like macro political side of that? So is there a particular social order or type of society that you C is also the benefit, like not so not on the individualistic side, but more about the. Uh, if you g could give it a name, what is it? Is it like democracy or justice or something like this? Hmm. Just a tiny question. Just a little. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a really nice question. So a couple things um, to say about it. I do think that the the changes that I focus on having been generated all happen at the individual level, at the level of the individual agent. And so it's, it's an individual agent who becomes increasingly able to sense vulnerability, for example, or it's, it's that agent that becomes able to live against the grain of norms. And then my hope is, to, is that those, or to have shown that those changes can have these broader moral effects on communities, right? So it seems like it's better for the whole community to have more people who are able to sense vulnerabilities and to live against the grain of norms. That could, that has the potential to change, you know, making less oppressive norms um, and so on. But it's a, it's an interesting sort of problem that I encountered, which is that, um, so when I first started writing about disorientations, I had in mind a two-part account. The first part would be all about individuals' disorientations. The second account would be all about communities being disoriented. And I started looking into all of these communities following things like natural disasters and um, major loss or major, you know, um, following the, um, I thought a lot about the Matthew Shepard case in the U.S. where a, a gay teen was killed um, and the community of Laramie, Wyoming tried to grapple with that and of course we know the Laramie Project and other, other things came out of that and so I thought about the community level of disorientation and then Eventually, I was I was sort of given the advice to not focus so much on that because it was enough to try and do the individual project. So I think there is something difficult about showing at a community level what happened, ha showing community experience at all, and then showing effects of community experience on a community. And because it's a totally different um, kind of area of empirical research that you have to look at, right? Whereas this comes out of very individualistic psychology, right? Clinical um, psychology, mostly the, the these effects. Also, some sociology and some, um, yeah, it's mostly sociology really and psychology. They're all focused on the individual level because there's such a bias towards thinking about individual agency, agency and individual agents and individual experiencers. So I think it's a it's a limit of the account actually that I mean my again my hope is that you know to show that these effects they they if they change people in the right ways those changes can can benefit whole communities and so on but I think it's an important point to note that I'm not talking about um, the communities themselves having experiences and I'm not talking about the the effects being at the community level and I think that people could talk about that but you'd need to engage different different research and maybe that different sort of empirical research which um
probably doesn't you know exist enough yet. It's definitely there, but I think more could be said about that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I'll keep thinking about it. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So I have two questions. I'll ask the first one, and then maybe somebody else will have a question. Otherwise, I'll ask it. Um, I had a question about, so one of the things that I think about when I think about disorientations, and that is really central, I think, to your claim in the book as well, is that not only are disorientations experienced differently by different people, but they're also kind of um, unevenly distributed or distributed in ways that um, that uh, that make it so that, for example, some people um, experience you know a particular toll of harmful disorientations, um, while others, for example, you know, experiencing feminist consciousness raising or white privilege, you know, for example, a white woman becoming familiarized with you know feminist literature and feminist concerns will experience disorientations in classroom settings or in her community, and become aware, for example, of her privilege as a white woman. But that's very different from somebody who might be um, experiencing or compounded harms of, you know, like racist oppression and migration, for example. And so, uh, just related to this question of of how they are they are distributed, I was wondering if if you have thought about the ways in which, like, is there? My question, I guess, is is there a way for for some of us to share the burden of disorientations in ways that would make it possible for people that experience a particularly heavy burden of disorientations to be, um, you know, how, how does cross disorientation work? For example, if I'm experiencing, I'm disoriented by my white privilege because I notice that my black coworker is experiencing discrimination that I've never faced, then we're both disoriented and in a way we share a, you know, to a certain extent, the experience of being disoriented, but um, my, my, my disorientation as a white woman is, you know, part and parcel of why, for example, this person might be disoriented. So I was wondering how, how you see this kind of, um, are there some structures of empathy or reciprocity that are pos possible across disorientations when people are experiencing very different and differently structured disorientations? That's such a nice question. Um, I think, so my, my first answer is that I don't think that disorientations can be shared in this way. What I say in the book, of course, is that um, what the role that people have to play in other people's disorientation is largely as an interpreter of it, allowing them to express being disoriented. And what I say, you know, this is drawing on the work of one of my PhD supervisors, Sue Campbell, who's totally brilliant, um, that it's, that's, the work, the work is of allowing people to express disorientation and thereby to have the disorientation in a certain way, right? To experience it and thereby potentially to experience its positive effects. So the role of the interpreter, if I'm coming to you and saying, you know, I'm experiencing grief, I don't know how to go on, and you respond to me with like, well, it's already been two months, you should get over it. Of course, you're not being a generous interpreter, whereas if you allow me to express to you, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing this grief, I'm disoriented, I don't know how to go on. If you're there and allow me, uh, allow me to express it and sometimes help me interpret it as disorientation, that's, uh, I, I think that that's a responsibility that you have and I think that that has the potential to um, allow me to have the experience in, in, a, in a way that could at least be potentially po positive. So that's what I've said about the role of others, really, is that we stand as interpreters for one another. And so in the case you talk about, you are the interpreter for the person, in, or one, hopefully, among many interpreters for the person in your workplace. Um, and they may be the interpreter for you as well, although they're unjustly burdened by their own disorientation at the time. Um, so I worry a bit about the idea of sharing and I don't think this is what you're suggesting because you're thinking about empathy or, or the ways that people can communicate, I think, about disorientations too. But I, I do worry a little bit about positioning it as though I could take any of the disorientation um, of, the, of the person disoriented by racism as a person disoriented by white privilege because it just, as right as you're pointing out, it's such a different, I mean, I'm not, I'm not actually experiencing that disorientation in the context of all the harms that have conditioned it. Um, and so I don't, I haven't thought a lot about that, that 
uh, that either transmission of disorientation, you might think there's some, there's literature on transmission of affect, we could think that way, or of empathy, or of sharing disorientation, or of like relieving the burden of disorientation mm -hmm. by taking some of it. I mean, all of that I feel like is interesting and needs to be thought through more. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes me think in, you know, I talk about George Yancey's work and he talks about um, the disorientation of white ambush and the disorientation of experiencing, you know, constant racism and double consciousness as a black man. And he, you know, these things are often in case, in interesting kind of cases that he gives. They're happening in the same room, the same classroom. He's experiencing this as a professor. Students are experiencing the disorientation of white ambush as students. They're there, it could happen. There could be some sort of transmission like that, but he is very, you know, it seems to me in, in his account as I've read it, there's a very clear line between these kind of things for good reason because it's a totally, you know, I wouldn't deny the student the opportunity to be disoriented by that, but it doesn't seem the same or, and it can't be compared just as I give the example of like, these things are, there's strain of feminist consciousness raising, but it's not the same strain as someone in your life dying, right? That it's a different kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I mean, that's, that's my first thought on it that mm -hmm. I, I have more worries than I have optimism mm -hmm. about thinking about sharing disorientations in that power laden, you know, um, asymmetrical kind of context. Mm -hmm. But I think that more should be thought about with respect to that. So I'd be interested to hear how that thinking goes in the future if people do it. Any other questions? So th thank you for uh, your lecture. Um, I was wondering if you have an account of like the kind of a, I don't know if it's the flip side, but orientation. Mm -hmm. And what's the relationship between orientation, disorientation, um, do they like feed into each other? Are they opposites? Are they mm -hmm. part of something bigger? Mm -hmm. I don't have that account. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the sense of orientation that would be the opposite to this kind of disorientation is one that I've been mostly troubled by, right? The sense of like really knowing how to go on, having a clear sense of what you're supposed to be doing, the moral resolve, I suppose, that I kind of position as challenged by disorientation. That's the closest that I can think of as uh, opposite. And that strikes me, there's lots of, you know, it, in, in moral philosophy, there's been lots said about the potential importance of that. And I, in the book, think that, yeah, it's important to know what we're doing often. I don't want to say that we should just all be wandering around not knowing what we're doing all the time. There are moral contexts in which it would be wrong to be unsure of how to go on, right? We should be sure of how to go on in some moral contexts. Um, but so, so while I acknowledge that that orientedness could be called for in some cases, for the most part, I've been trying to say, no, we need to focus on the, the, the potential positives of disorientation. Um, so I don't know, I, I think that there is some work um, I've been in touch with a, a grad student in the, US, in the UK who's doing some work on orientedness as a non-opposite to disorientation, like thinking of it as a, he's worried that maybe I position disorientation too much as, as an opposite to orientation and he wants to think about these things separately so that orientedness could be one positive thing and disorientedness could be another positive thing and that seems right to me or, or fruitful to me to think that way, but I haven't thought about that way yet. Thank you. Um, this is a bit of a general question, but I wanted to know if you could speak more about, um, you mentioned the medicalization of disorientation and how that can lead to sort of uneven resources and support for different orienta disorientations depending on how they're categorized or whether they're pathologized or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted to, yeah, hear a bit more about that and I guess about how that can manifest itself and what the effects of that can be. I think, and I don't know if this is answering your question, I think what I have said in this piece is that by medicalizing disorientations, certain kinds of disorientations, that means that they get a lot of attention from healthcare systems and criminal justice systems sometimes. Um, where well, at the same time, other experiences of disorientation don't get the attention that they need. So there's a lot of focus, for example, on 
Um, some kinds of, you know, the, the case of Charlotte Perkins Gilman is, is one where there's a lot of attention on it because she was violating this gender norm, she was taking her child, she was breaking up a marriage, she was potentially queer. There was a lot of like worry about it, a lot of policing of what was going on there. So it, it got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. Whereas, so that, and that was a medicalized case. Whereas some other kinds of experiences like just ordinary grief or ordinary not knowing how to go on after an illness diagnosis, um, ordinary, um, you know, the, the experiences of migration, for example, and the disorientations associated with those, the everyday things that could actually use quite a bit more support don't get the support. Mm -hmm. So I think that the claim that I try to make there is that we shouldn't see we shouldn't see some disorientations as bad and others as like not bad and, and thereby distribute the attention resources accordingly. The bad, dangerous ones get all mm -hmm. the attention, get all the resources, and the not dangerous ones get no resources or attention because I actually think all these, I'm worried about the criminal and the over, the criminal justice attention and the over medicalization of these ones, but I'm also worried about the ordinary ones not getting any support or attention. Right, so people disoriented by, um, you know, the birth of a child, or by feminist consciousness raising, or by whatever ordinary everyday kinds of things that that don't actually get the sort of support they need. Yeah. I think that's that's what the claim was. So the kind of dichotomy of health and illness, where these are the bad ones, they're going to get all the attention because they're they're met, they're illness related, they're dangerous. These are the okay ones, and therefore they don't need any attention at all. That 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 distribution of attention resources worries me. That's that's the claim that I make in this paper, at least. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much again, and if anybody has questions and they didn't want to ask them in front of everyone, we can take some time for that as well. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming.